Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I have with me uh, Mahesh Bharadwaj, and he is the head of Europe Analytics at uh, Funding Circle. I'm really excited to have Mahesh here. We're going to be talking about building a value-adding analytics function. Um, but before we do that, uh, Mahesh, I'd like to welcome you and uh, get you to say hello and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Jason. Uh, lovely to be here with you. I do enjoy the podcast that you have, and it's uh, great to have the opportunity to be part of it. So, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and a happy new year. You and too, a happy of new course. year to all of your uh, viewers and listeners as well. Um, my name is Mahesh Bharadwaj. I've been in the analytics field in one way or the other for about the last 15 plus years. Okay. And I currently work with Funding Circle as the head of Europe Analytics. Before this, I was with uh, Barclays uh, in London. Prior to that, I was with Oliver Wyman in New York. And prior to that, I was with Capital One, both out of their Nottingham offices, as well as their Washington, D.C., McLean suburbs offices. I worked across credit risk. I worked across custom analytics. And what's really something that I found very important throughout my career is I love the technical aspect of the job, but I love delivering value to my organizations much more. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, um, we'll get on well then, because that's, I think, the most important thing when it comes to analytics is that value point. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about Funding Circle as well, um, as the organization you're at now, just a bit about who they are, um, what they do, their business model, something like that would be great. Absolutely happy to. Funding Circle is the leading small business loans platform, right? right. What we do across the UK and the US is connect small businesses that need funding with lenders who are willing to fund them. And right. it's important that you understand why we do this. Small businesses power the global economy, right? They're about 50 to 60% of all firms out there. They drive 50 to 60% of GDP, about 70% of employment, and they provide a lot of the services that we all use, right from the baker right. around the corner to someone who's running an ice cream van out in summer, right? right. Now, historically, despite the size and impact of these small businesses, they have formed only about 2% of most banks' balance sheets. Right. And because of the large sums of money that small businesses need in comparison to typical consumers, the process for obtaining finance for a small business has always been pretty complicated, time-consuming, and full of paperwork and slow processes. Right. Now, on the consumer side, on the other hand, you see that you can just apply for a credit card or a loan and you have an instant decision. Mm. And you get your answer very quickly and you get the funds in your account as well very quickly. Funding Circle was founded with the mission to try and make it as easy for small businesses to get funding as possible. Got it. And this is what we do. We have over the past uh, 11 odd years, uh, now I'm coming up on the 12th year from 2010, consistently striven to give small businesses easy and quick access to funds so that they can focus on growing their business rather than filling out forms and submitting paperwork. Mm. Nice. I um yeah. Well, as a as a growing small business, I, I can I can certainly see uh, see that the benefit of that, which is great. Um, and of course, as you say, there's there's some um, learnings and similarities with what the consumer um, financial services market has done and, and gone very digital, very agile, very mobile first, um, and made the things that have been quite difficult in um, in the the banking industry much more straightforward from a consumer point of view. I'm, I'm sure there's some legacy back end to integrate with that, that that's challenging so great well thank you for introducing um the funding circle to us and to um and to yourself as well um the the um just a bit more about you actually i, I sort of interested um has that all all of that um history at uh, the organizations you mentioned been in and around analytics and data um or have you been sort of more in sort of technology or more in in kind of business side of um uh, sort of commercial side, I should say, probably of, of the organizations? That's actually a very interesting question you pose. Not so much on the technology side, although a lot of what I do has involved technological delivery of yep. uh, key um, aspects to the customers and so on. Hmm. Um, and to your question of have I been on the commercial side, the way I think of it is I'm always on the commercial side. Love it. So yeah. whatever I do from an analytics perspective, and even when I was uh, working in risk, um, the purpose of credit risk is to enable a business to grow commercially while keeping within a boundary of risk. Right. It's not about elimination of risk. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to eliminate credit risk, you just don't lend to anybody. But that's mm -hmm. not a very viable business plan. Mm -hmm. 
the objective is to enable the organization to reach as many customers as possible with as relevant an offering as possible while also maintaining some controls maintaining credit risk and making sure that the business gets the appropriate returns yeah and so while i have worked on the analytics and credit risk fields uh, and while i was with oliver wyman i was consulting for a number of organizations which again involved the delivery of analytical work what i have always striven to deliver is commercial benefit mm-hmm. to whichever organizations i have worked for now yeah. commercial benefit is very often conflated with pounds and dollars and savings and revenues and profits but it could also be something as simple as a reduction in number of hours of work to complete a person, particular task mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so if we can reduce the amount of fters or can we reduce the amount of complaints or the amount of time wasted by customers trying to go through a particular online process or a telephonic process and allow them to get to the solutions they want yeah those are also of commercial benefit or customer benefit yeah i i guess um anything that um that impacts the the work that the the company does serving customers supporting employees um, making it more efficient anything like that is is sort of under that banner of of value adding and and you're saying your all of your focus regardless of the role you've been in has been on finding ways to add value and, and obviously more recently in through through the analytics lens so um let's um let's dig into that a bit because that doesn't that doesn't just happen and and i've got a fair amount of experience in this industry to know that a not everyone thinks that way um and even if people think that way find it hard to execute that way um and building a team um and a function and an organization that can that receive that kind of mindset and and sort of um end up delivering uh delivering on the promise uh, can be a challenge so uh, it would be great to sort of dig into that a bit more and so i i suppose you know we, we talked about this being around how, how we build a value adding analytics function what, what's important to you on 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 that journey what's important in terms of how you go about or the important components of a, a, a team a function that is focused on adding value and yeah, this is interesting right i think it starts from the top obviously the person who's sort of setting up the team building the team has to have that attitude to start with hmm. but when you go about building a team it's very important to focus on a number of elements very often when we hire in the analytics data field we tend to look at skills qualifications yeah. accomplishments right now these are important the critical to get right it is a technical function and you need somebody who meets the bar from a technical perspective but what's equally important in fact in some cases more important is to make sure we hire people whose intrinsic values tend to align with those of the company and of mm-hmm. the team they're joining yeah so let me give you an example with uh, funding circle we have five key values think smart make it happen be open stand together live the adventure so when we're hiring we tend to look for people who and in addition to all of their achievements accomplishments demonstrate an ability to challenge assumptions hmm. to take ownership for their work to be passionate about their work we also look to ensure that these hires have a demonstrated ability to work respectfully with others that they work as a team that they're focused on winning together not just winning for themselves mm-hmm. right now that's what you look for when you're hiring now you have to build the team so when you have the team members on board you look to help them understand the team vision understand the team mission and then you give them the free reign to explore satisfy their curiosity learn grow as much as possible and do great things hmm. you ensure that they can do that along the journey by giving them the support the recognition the opportunity they need but also i think it's important they need to have fun while doing this right hmm. and in general if you put the key pieces in place in terms of you've got the people with the right values you've given them the right support and recognition you've given them free reign to explore their curiosity to ask questions without fear you tend to get a lot of great results and along the way people tend to have a lot of fun yeah yeah the i think i like that the um that kind of focus on the organization's values and 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 there's a you know there's a phrase in this industry isn't there around um you know a, a cult a data driven culture or a culture of data and 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 the values around focusing on data but but actually you know 
the thing that makes data successful is aligning to the values of the organization and aligning to the objectives of the organization. That's made way, way more important than trying to kind of overlay data on top of it all. Um, is that, have you found that to be um, an, an important sort of accelerant, I suppose, to, to the success you, you've had? Yeah, I think, you know, when people say data-driven culture, it tends to sound a bit technical, mm -hmm. right? Let me frame it this way. Let's call it a fact-driven culture. Let's make decisions to the extent we can based on the facts that are available on the ground. Hmm. If those facts are gettable, let's go and get those facts. If those facts are not gettable, let's try and triangulate to where they are. And then let's apply the judgment. Yeah. You can often find that in some organizations from time to time, people forget this truth and they tend to make judgments based on beliefs, judgments based on prior experience, which may or may not be relevant today. Uh, judgments based on what they think is the right way to do things without looking at what the customer may really want or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. So data-driven culture is great, but essentially data then gets processed into information, which gets processed into insights. Those insights and those facts can then drive decision-making. Yeah. And so when you talk about data-driven culture, I think this is where people think, oh, well, that means I need to have a huge data team and I need to invest in data. All of those are stepping stones to making well-informed decisions with the best yeah. insights at your disposal. Yeah. And is that, and again, that, that mindset um, aligns nicely to your mindset around focusing on value and it mind, aligns nicely to the mindset of focusing on the organization's values. Um, do, do you, the, the team that you build, do you find that um, that understanding, that focus, that it's that it's outcome first, not data first. Um, you know, you can get a bit kind of on an ivory tower, can't you? And, and sort of start saying, well, data is the most important thing here. Well, no, outcome is the most important thing. The insights are a, a, a stepping stone to that outcome. Um, is that a thing you test for either, you know, through through discussion or some other way um, for, pe for people that sort of join the team and, and, and help deliver your function? It's, it's a good point you make. There is an element of testing for it, right? But we're not in the business of only hiring the people who absolutely 100% fit the mold. You'll never get someone like that. Those are the unicorns of the world. Yeah. It's important to test for it. You want people who largely align to start with, who have a curiosity, a desire to grow and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's as important to train for it, yeah. right? And this brings me uh, to what I think of as the ABCs of getting into the data and analytics space. Right. Okay. Let me elaborate. Um, A for me is, of course, analytics and data. This is the deep technical knowledge that enables people to deliver on their jobs and add value to the firm. On this front, we obviously support everyone we hire with formal training, with shadowing, with documentation to ensure that they can keep on the cutting edge of the field and they can deliver what they need to do. Mm. Very often, organizations will tend to start and stop right there yeah. from a perspective of training. But then I think the B and the C are very important. Let me dive into those a bit. Okay. The B is the behavioral skills. How do people interact with stakeholders? How do they work effectively in a team? Do they communicate effectively with their coworkers, whether technical coworkers in the data analytics team or non-technical coworkers and stakeholders? Are they able to project manage effectively? Are they able to escalate when the situation requires? Mm -hmm. Now, this comes from a combination of formal training but also shadowing, advice and feedback over time, depending on how people are performing. And what we do is we commit our managers to ensuring that people get the support that they need here. Yeah. Right. So you always observe, give immediate feedback and help people improve on this. Yeah. And then finally, the C. And this, I think, is, again, something which needs to be very clearly focused. It's for conceptual and commercial skills. At the end of the day, we are here to serve a commercial need, a customer need, an investor need. And therefore our solutions have to be practical. Yeah. I'll give you an example. If I have a data scientist who's building a model and they come up with a model which is 10% better, do they also automatically consider whether adding these new variables which make the model 10% better are going to add 50, 60% to the build and deployment time of the model? What about value today versus value tomorrow? Yeah. Not to say that you stop there. You can obviously have a version two and a version three, but is there a bias towards action, a bias towards generating value immediately, followed by incremental improvements on top of that? Yeah. Closely related to this are what I call the key conceptual skills. 
what are the problems that the particular team in, in question is actually trying to solve? Will the model actually solve for that? Um, I think conceptual skills abound. You've heard of survivor bias, but very often mm -hmm. you find just understanding the difference between sunk costs and prospective costs, fixed costs and variable costs. And understanding of those tends to drive better numerate decision-making, better analytics, and at the end of the day, better modeling. Yeah. The, um, is, have you got a priority for those um, in terms of what's important? The, the, obviously, ABC uh, lays it out in the alphabet, alphabetical order, but you know, it, would you say that that commercial awareness and ability to understand the business and, and what the organization is trying to achieve and the customers and what the metrics mean, all those good things, um, that behavioral side, which I personally think is like a huge thing, sorry not to lead the witness, and or, or the analytics, the A, the, the data side, what, what, what is there a ranking it, or, and, and or does it depend on the role of, of the person in, and the team? I think you've hit it exactly right. And we'd probably touch on this as we talk about uh, this a bit more. Everybody needs to meet a base level across all three. Yeah. Right? Now, some of the latter stuff on conceptual and commercial skills is also organization dependent. Mm. So you get into a situation where our duty when someone comes into the firm is to teach them how the organization works, teach them what it is we do, teach them what's important, what's not, right? Yeah. Because with the best will in the world, even if you're coming from a very similar organization, you're not going to know exactly what we do here. So that's a bit on us. Yeah. And there is a bare minimum level across all three, which we would test for and we've, which we would also train for. And obviously as people grow their careers, the level required rises. Yeah. But you're right, it depends on the role. So if you're doing a deep technical modeling role, I would want you to be a bit more on the cutting edge of things. If you're also managing stakeholders and delivering something which needs to be delivered on a regular basis, I would sort of emphasize those skills a bit more as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not to say that if you come in with a certain mix of those skill sets, you are forever tied into that particular sort of role. Yeah. The point of us as human beings is we are versatile. We look to learn, we look to grow ourselves and over time we do. Yeah. As a result, it's quite important that we have a growth mindset in the people we hire. And as long as that's there, we can always grow everyone. Yeah. So interestingly, two, two of the C's um, that I thought of when you, when you started talking about um, ABC was um, communication and collaboration. And, and, and I, they're, they're two really important. I mean, they could be behavioral, actually. They could be under your B as well. But um, uh, I, I think they're um from a from a mindset and a, and a ways of working perspective and and how do we really make this work they're like really really high up for me um regardless of the of the role you're in um do they play a part in 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 your in your thinking and 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 if so again where does where does that sit in terms of how much sort of credence you give them priority you give them when you're when you're looking to build out your team absolutely and communication collaboration skills as you mentioned are what I bring under the broader umbrella of behavioral skills. Right. So when I talked about teamwork, when I talked about uh, knowing how to manage stakeholders, when I talked about effective communication, those were the skills I was speaking about. Right. Because to me, a lot of them are learned behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think, for example, one of the earliest behaviors you have to learn as a technical hire or a very skilled mathematical hire in any firm is that while you might have a great passion and a great love for the data, and a great love for the mathematics, um, subjecting your commercial and or marketing stakeholders to the specific details of the wonderful linear regression you've done isn't really that interesting to them. Yeah. Or it might be interesting to some of them, but it's not really the point of the meeting mm -hmm. that you've called. Yeah. The point of the meeting you've called is, this is the model, this is the benefit it drives for the organization com commercially, whether that's a cost saving or a speed to market or an increase in revenue or response. Yeah. And so that's why I would put that more on the behavioral skills. And it's one of the things that people need to unlearn sometimes when they come, especially from uh, very deep technical skills with amazing degrees and amazing education. And they've had the experience talking to people yeah. who are like them. You now have to unlearn some of that and speak to people who are quite unlike you. But you know what? It takes all types to run an organization. It takes all types to actually make the organization go around. And that's yeah. what's important. People have the skill of how to collaborate with and how to communicate with people who are fundamentally different to them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's almost a, 
Um, I'm not sure double edged sword is the right is the right phrase, but you know you want to build a diverse team that have lots of differences that celebrate differences that is inclusive, but equally there needs to be this similar um, alignment to these sorts of values, these sorts of behaviors, and and that could be that could be quite um, quite a challenge. But interestingly, the, you talk about the um, communication and collaboration being you know something that that people can learn but i think isn't it it's quite important that the environment um i suppose the culture of the organization is such that communication and collaboration is is at the heart of what they do because again i've seen organizations where that's something that where it's required for data because data is horizontal it cuts across everything it has potential to impact lots of people so it needs it needs collaboration it needs coordination and that needs communication but culturally collaboration isn't a thing that happens you know teams work in silos um sort of fiefdoms different pnls are running um it sort of prevents almost prevents the collaboration from happening um so that yeah the environment that's created the culture that is, exists needs to allow for it doesn't it sort of give people the space to breathe and and, and collaborate and talk to each other um i presume presumably it sounds like that's a setup that you guys have got at funding circle yeah i will call back to the values i called out earlier mm-hmm. right? in terms of we believe in being open. We believe in making it happen. Yeah. We are very respectful with each other. And therefore, we all are pulling in the same direction. We have the same values. We have the same goal. Yeah. We have the same passion we bring to the table every day. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be disagreements. The disagreements will not be about, well, I want to do this and how you want to do this. The disagreements will be about, I believe this is the best way to give the best customer experience. Mm-hmm. And you might say, well, no, I believe this is the best way to be- give the best customer experience. Yeah. Or you might raise a very reasonable question that I agree that that's the best way to deliver the customer experience, but we cannot do that at scale right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's a more nuanced conversation, which you can then get into. And- yeah. Which all takes a, a level of experience and, and skill to, to be able to manage that conversation. It kind of leads me on to the, the sort of a connected um, uh, kind of thought process here, which is, in order to to be that kind of fu- analytics function that you've articulated there and the, 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 with the kind of skills, the kind of behaviors, um, it, it can't live in it. So it can't, almost can't live in a silo. It can't be its own team sort of disappearing off working, um, you know, uh, on a bunch of stuff and and, and, it, and pro- data products appear out the other end of it. it and it was, we've just talked about it needs that collaboration. But in order to almost be accepted as an organization, as a data organization that acts that way, um, the wider stakeholder stakeholders within the organization need to almost um, accept that that's that's the way things work and also I've seen almost build a level of respect um, in the wider stakeholder group that there's some value to be added here this isn't just a service function that provides stuff it's a value adding service that that the, the interactivity, the collaboration, the talking, the discussing, the failing, the testing, the figuring some stuff out together is really where you win. So have you had to go through a process of, uh, um, or, or activities or whatever it might be of sort of building that respect? Was it just there and, and, and you were fortunate that you could like run with it? Um, you know, how, how's that sort of panned out? Have you got that? Does that, does that exist now? Are you still working towards it? I think of this as something that has existed at Funding Circle for a while. It was built over time by my predecessors. But I think the key here is you always have to build it when you go to a new team. Even if the team has the credibility, you have to build the personal credibility. Yeah, true. And even when it's built, it always needs to be sustained. Yes, you're only as good as your last uh, data product. (laughs) And I think... It goes back to some of the things I've spoken about earlier. Stakeholders respect you the most when they see that you're looking to deliver value to the firm. Mm. And as a result, to all of them, yeah. rather than pursuing an agenda they don't understand. Now, within yeah. the funding circle, they're all focused on the same mission. So we tend to all be pointing in the same direction. But it's also important for me to explicitly and implicitly communicate to my stakeholders, this is what I am seeking to do. This is what my mm. team is seeking to do. And how we're planning to do it. Yeah. Now, this might be a bit easier for something like marketing optimization, right? You can call out cost-benefit ratios and so on. But for any activity that my team does, I find it important, and I think it's very useful, to actively call out the clear commercial or operational or reputational benefits, even of efforts which might come across as somewhat esoteric. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me give you an example. 
single customer view. You've heard of this, something yeah. that's banded about. Obviously, it has a ton of profitability, operational benefits in long term. But you can also frame it as much greater efficiency in pulling subject access requests. Yeah. Right? So right. it doesn't always have to be about the money. Mm. But that's just an example of how something that's a bit esoteric, which is not something that someone outside the data space is necessarily going to be particularly interested in, can also be communicated in a way that makes them appreciate what it is that you're trying to do. Well, it allows you to frame, in that example, it allows you to frame the the solution, single view of customer, in terms of the, the multiple benefits it could provide. So the ability exactly. to target customers better, the ability to understand your customers, the cross-sell, upsell, subject access requests, you know, all, all, those, all those kind of use cases that sit around why have a single view of customer, you, you can sort of articulate all of those. And, the, and, and I guess it sounds like those um those those use cases are, are sort of spread across different people so it allows you to sort of like widen out the stakeholder audience that potentially could care absolutely now one of the other things i will say is while that's great to have something which gets you wide buying from stakeholders early on when you're establishing the team or establishing yourself or just trying to build the value of the analytics team in the minds of the stakeholders one of the key things i found very useful and which i tend to focus on is making sure that I found one or two projects that can be delivered very quickly, that very clearly adds value to the organization. Hmm. Helps if you can quantify it. Yeah. Right? The very first one or two projects that you do, it's useful if it can be quantified. So many yeah. pounds of revenue, so many pounds of profit, or so many FDR saved, or so many complaints reduced per month. If you can do that, that buys you a sort of instant credibility. Yeah. Thereafter, it's regular communication, regular engagement, regular alignment of goals and efforts. And again, always with a view to see how the analytics and data teams can contribute to growth initiatives across the firm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Love it. Um, and, and, and yeah, back to the sort of original question was around building that respect. I think, I think you basically talk about building that respect by, by focusing on the things that people care about. And if you focus on the things that people care about, then you're able to, um, you know, make this about what you know what what the business is trying to achieve rather than what data is trying to achieve and, and what the data is about um that's a, that's a nice way of going about it i mean in, in terms of then the team that you have in place to do that i mean we touched on um some of the training you know some people arrive ready made some people arrive great in some areas um and, and need some training in certain certain areas how have you got a um a, a, some best practice that you've put in or, or some ways you've gone about developing the developing the team both from a skills perspective but also a career path perspective because i imagine with a mix of skills that you've got in the analytics function serving the full organization that, that, that they might change the kind of people that you've got the kind of way they progress the way they get trained the way they move through the organization absolutely uh, let me share that in two broad parts i'll talk about how you develop and train up your team and then i'll talk about the career path uh, stuff later okay. um Talking about development, let me give you an, a sense of the things we do, but also the ethos that underlies them. Let me first give you the examples of things we do. Uh, at Funding Circle, we believe that an ability to continuously learn on the job is extremely important. Mm. So formally, what we do is we provide all employees with full access to LinkedIn Learning. And we also have a program called Money to Do More, which allows all employees a budget to spend on any additional training or books that they need for their learning. Now, this is buttressed by other regular training within the firm. We call them funding circle academies, where our employees share knowledge and training with each other. We also have specialized training for every from everyone from new graduates to managers to senior leaders too. Right. And we're also actively focused on learning by doing. Within the risk and analytics team, which I'm a part of, we also conduct a number of knowledge sharing sessions and hackathons throughout the year where people can come together and learn while solving a live business problem. So we're getting value out of it as an organization and people are getting learning out of it. We also support people in owning their personal development and journey and to pursue a career pathway that's right for them. This may mean doing something completely different to when they join the company. So people can go into different tracks here, which I'll talk about in a minute. Bringing it all together, why do we do all this? What's the ethos underlying it? Now, let's take an example of uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, you've probably seen the movie. It's a famous quote, always be closing. It's almost used as a mantra for salespeople. It is, yeah. Now, at Funding Circle, our mantra might well be always be learning. 
right? You have the opportunity to always be learning at Funding Circle. Mm. Mm. Every which field, every which aspect of learning that you want is made available to you. Right? So that's our learning ethos. And now I can talk about our career paths. I actually find this something which is very close to my heart, right? So I believe that force-fitting people into a limited range of career paths is damaging to them, is damaging to the organization. Mm -hmm. And within the risk and analytics team, we realize that not everyone needs or wants to become a line manager or manage stakeholders in order to progress their careers. That's why we offer colleagues a range of career paths. Today, let me talk to you about the two pathways here, which is generalist and specialist career paths for data scientists. Right. Now, the generalist data science pathway is the familiar one. The folks on this pathway would focus on driving growth by combining a deep conceptual understanding of the business with highly numerate analyses and models to identify structure and size opportunities. Right. And to deliver these, they use strong communication skills, strong stakeholder management skills, and in due course, they go on to manage teams. So when people think of a traditional career pathway for a data scientist, this is the one that tends to come to mind. Yeah. Data science, senior data scientist, data science manager, exactly. director of data science. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Now, what we also offer uniquely, is a specialist data scientist pathway for mm -hmm. colleagues who want to go into depth, who want to pursue the cutting edge techniques and who want to specialize. Mm -hmm. This actually enables colleagues an extended period of career growth without requiring people management or stakeholder management. Right. They can use the mind space they would have spent learning all of that to go really deep and learn a ton of cutting edge techniques. Right? So this enables them to grow their career while doing what they love doing. Hmm. And so essentially uh, what would happen is instead of becoming data science manager, you'd become a lead data scientist, a principal data scientist and so on. Okay. Yeah. Further, colleagues are not required to commit to one or the other pathway forever. You can pick yeah. one and then eventually you move back and so on. Yeah. You can change your mind. Yeah. And to what I alluded to earlier, we allow people to choose their career pathways. In fact, more broadly, we promote the fact that careers don't have to be linear at all. Mm. Uh, if you've read the book by Helen Tupper and Sarah Ellis, we believe that careers can be squiggly. So squiggly careers, you can mm. sort of move through an organization and learn a lot as mm. you go through my own career is somewhat squiggly. Right? I did a bit of risk, I did some finance, I did analytics, uh, I did consultancy, all with a commercial mm -hmm. bent, all with a purpose uh, where I was delivering value to the customers and the business, yeah. but very varied in its yeah. extent. At the end of the day, what I care about is that the people on my team, and what we care about more broadly at Funding Circle is that all of our colleagues are engaged, are learning, and are having fun. Yeah, well, a nice three important uh, components components to uh, to a nice team. Um, well, no, I think um, it's a great uh, uh, place to kind of start wrapping up. Hearing about how um, you develop individuals and that ethos of uh, always be learning, I really like. I'm going to steal that one uh, shamelessly for uh, for my own team. Um, and um, but no, listen, it's been great. It's been great talking to you. I, the the, the um, you know relatively new business funding circle in uh, relative terms, um, um, making great progress, and uh, sounds like you know powered by um, strong analytics with a strong analytics function and an ethos that is you know focus on outcomes, um, focus on improvement, um, and focus on building a an organization that uses the data it's got to to help improve the service that you provide. So. Um, yeah, it sounds like an, an awesome place to work and appreciate you coming to share um, some of that story, some of that learning uh, with us today, Mahesh. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me, Jason. As I said, I enjoy the podcast and to be a part of it is uh, amazing as well. And I do hope that uh, what I've said here helps other data leaders, other data managers, and even others getting into data and analytics yeah. as a career, think about how they want to grow their careers. Yeah, amazing. As you say, squiggly. I like that. Yeah, well, um, that's not mine. That's uh, Sarah's uh, uh, and uh, Helen. So you might want to look up their book. I will. Do, I will do. So listen, thanks so much, Mahesh. Really appreciate it. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, I found it fascinating to hear um, all about Finding Circle and the journey Mahesh has gone on. Um, I hope you did too. Um, and there's plenty more to come soon. So catch you again soon.